Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us um, and welcome to Ask the Expert. So today we're going to be learning about glass blowing with expert Josh Simpson. But first, I'll introduce myself. My name is Teresa, and I'm a GBH host and a glass blowing enthusiast. Um, I'd like to thank everyone that is joining us today, including especially our leadership circle and our LS members. We appreciate your generous and continued support. Um, before we get started, I want to introduce our expert for the afternoon, Josh Simpson. Josh, thank you so much for being with us. Um, I know that you're excited to share a slideshow that you've put together um, for us, but I want you to hang tight on that for just a moment. Um, wow. Josh, how are you doing? Just great. How are you, Teresa? It's nice to see you. I'm good. I'm good. It's nice to see you as well. So before we get started, I want to explain for um, our audience how this is going to work. So many of you may be new to Zoom, and we want to make sure that you have a great experience with us here today. Um, so you, our audience, are not on video at all, and we're not going to be able to hear you speak, so don't worry about that. We won't be seeing your living rooms or your beds filled with pillows if that's where you're at this afternoon. Um, but we do want to hear questions from you. So you can ask questions and share comments um, by opening the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and typing your questions into that. The Q&A tab looks like two sort of like conversation bubbles, um, and that's where you can find that down at the bottom. If you see a question already in the Q&A um, and you also want to hear the answer to it, you can upvote it by clicking on the thumbs up. Um, and the question that gets moved to the top is the one that I'll obviously prioritize answering. So I also want to introduce our behind the scenes folks um, from GBH um, who are, um, won't be visible during the show, but they're the ones pulling the strings and connecting with you. Um, and so we wanna just say hello with them for a moment here. So first we have Bailey, one of our event producers. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. We're really excited about glass blowing and we hope you enjoy everything. So thank you. Thank you, Bailey. And next we have Jen, who's gonna be keeping an eye on the question and answer section. Hi everybody, <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks for joining us today. Really excited to see all your questions. Um, if you submit a question in the Q&A, please let us know where you're tuning in from and we'll give you a little shout out. Talk soon. Thank you, Jen. All right, so without further ado, I would like to introduce Josh Simpson. Um, Josh first started experimenting with glass when he was a student at Hamilton College in 1970. And over the last 45 years, his art has evolved and grown as he has experimented, made mistakes, and learned from the records of old masters, from his contemporaries, and from his own experience, of course. He found artistic inspiration in many aspects of his natural surroundings, but none more profound than the images from space that were sent back to Earth by early astronauts. While he's been very successful producing unique goblets that are, and other more standard glass forms, perhaps his greatest satisfaction and fame is derived from his glass planets. They are these beautiful, unique spheres encasing whimsical scenes and other world surfaces. One of Apollo's astronauts glanced out um, of his spacecraft window and said, or I'm sorry, one of the o Apollo astronauts glanced out of his spacecraft window and said, I can cover the Earth with my thumb. And Josh captures that concept by creating planets that can be held in one's hand. Josh has devoted himself to mastering all aspects of glass blowing, um, from learning the chemistry of adding metallic oxides to create spectrum, a spectrum of colors, to learning how to build his own furnace and his own tools, to mastering the ancient techniques of blowing and forming. Um, Josh, I'm looking forward to seeing your slideshow and then chatting a bit more with you. I'm looking forward to showing you. I'm here in my glass studio, actually with all my furnaces turned off at the moment, but um, but I should, I, I've got a, a, some slides that I can show you. And uh, if you want, I can try to do that. I'll try to start my, share my screen and start my slide talk. Hang on. Of course, it doesn't work as well as it did before, but we'll do this. <laughs> You're doing great. Okay. You're doing great. Okay, so let me start here and 
Hopefully you'll be able to see that in a moment. Uh, let's press play. It's, uh, there it goes. Okay, so I'm out in Western Massachusetts, uh, a couple hours west of Boston. And well, I can just start by saying that glass is an alchemic blend of sand and metallic oxides combined with extraordinary blinding heat. The result is a material that uh, flows and drips like honey. When it's hot, glass is alive. It moves gracefully and inexorably in response to gravity and centripetal force. It possesses an inner light and transcendent radiant heat that make it simultaneously one of the most fascinating and one of the most ridiculously frustrating materials for an artist to work with. I began in 1971, actually, almost 50 years ago, um, making wine goblets and other things like that. But um, I, at the time, I was completely amazed by the Apollo astronauts who had just landed on the moon in 69. And uh, at the time, in my glass studio, I had uh, kids coming to visit. And I started to make, they, the kids weren't interested in wine goblets actually stopped making wine goblets in 1987, but kids um, were interested in me making little marbles. And so I started to make marbles that were really meant to be little planets. And doing that, it's amazing. Um, planets are just an interesting thing. Everybody gets it. They're these small spheres, and, but I also make them very large. And they allow me to put incredible amounts of detail and interesting things going on inside. And um, there's just no end to the variety that I can and the things that I can do. Planets are amazing. They've, uh, they've been very successful. People, I, I do make lots of other work, but people understand them. This is the Corning Museum of Glass. And... Peabody Essex Museum, but uh, planets seem to transcend uh, age and gender and ethnicity and religion and nationality. And actually they will last a long time. They can even last for generations. So things that I made 50 years ago are still vibrant and alive today. Lately, my work has involved making things that I, I, I love Hubble Space Telescope and Chandra X-ray Observatory uh, space photos. And so I've been making large disks, large platters that sort of mimic Hubble Space Telescope photos. This actually is a, a, a Hubble photo of the Great Nebula in Orion. And this is the center of one of my platters. Making them is really amazingly fun. It's this energetic process it's kind of if you ever watched glass if you watch glass players it's like watching football players trying to do ballet you have to be careful and gentle and but lifting this uh, giant lump of molten liquid glass so i want to introduce my uh, my crew this is my team last fall and here we are a couple of days ago and uh and let's see, oh, and I should also say that all of the electric power from my studio, not the propane gas, but all the electric power from my studio is made with these solar panels uh, that are just south of this studio. And those are my slides. So I'll stop sharing my screen and we can go to questions if anybody has any. Josh, that's so amazing. I, I mean, your art is like really beautiful and kind of like distractingly so. Um, I was particularly interested in how you said that some of your earliest inspiration came from working with children. Um, so can you tell me a little bit more about that, that there were sort of like kids that inspired you to make marbles? Oh, uh oh. I think that Josh might be frozen. We'll give him just a moment. 
but it looks like he might be frozen. So I'm going to bring in um, my coworker and colleague and friend, Sarah. Um, Sarah, can you join us up here on the screen for a moment? Of course I can. How you doing, Teresa? I'm good, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks. Um, I'm just here to give you guys all a message about um, what we can do to continue to support GBH during this time. So thanks everyone so much for spending an hour of your time during today's Ask the Expert event. GBH offers a wide variety of events made possible thanks to people like you who care about the work that we do. If you haven't already, we encourage you to become a sustaining member or make a donation. To do so, you can wear your support for GBH on your sleeve because back by popular demand, we have our heathered gray tee, which is now vintage and has our WGBH logo with Boston in orange on it. Please sign on as a sustainer as a w, uh, at $7.50 a month, or you can give $90 all at once, and we'll thank you with this shirt for a limited time only. Uh, now more than ever, it's crucial to stay informed on what is happening in the world, and your backing helps us provide information that you can trust, along with events that you can enjoy. To do so, you can go to wgbh.org slash support events by making a donation. And you can receive this shirt as a token, a token of our thanks. It's super easy bleh, to make it super easy for you. We actually just dropped the link in the chat, so you can go ahead and click that now. Anyway, back to you, Teresa. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, those shirts are so cute and I definitely want one. I also love that um, all of our old WGBH shirts are now considered vintage because it makes me feel very fancy and I like vintage clothing. Um, and I've got a few, but I got to get my hands on that Heather Gray one for sure. I must admit, I do have one. It's in the wash currently, but it's some of the softest shirts I've ever had. I feel like as soon as it comes out of the wash, I put it right back on. Yes, exactly. They are, those shirts are incredibly soft and absolutely perfect. I totally agree. Okay, so I understand that Josh had a little bit of um, complications with his computer, but he's getting himself rebooted. Um, so as he's bringing himself back, um, I want to just say hello to some of the people who are joining us this afternoon. Um, so we have Tom, who is zooming in from Richmond, Virginia. We have Sandra, who's zooming in from Hopkinton, Hopkinton, Massachusetts. Um, we have Morton, who's in Norton, Mass. Um, we have Sue, who is in, who's out on the Cape Cod. Um, we have Marcella, who's in East Hampton, Mass. Um, it looks like we have a ton of people from all over. There's also somebody who's zooming in with us from Pagosa Springs, Colorado, which I love. Uh, I think Josh is out in Western Mass. I'm in Providence, Rhode Island, and we thought that maybe we were the ones coming in from the furthest distance, but it looks like the furthest distance is per possibly all the way out in Colorado. So welcome. Um, we're really glad to have everybody here um, and glad to have folks here talking with us about glass blowing. Um, oh, we also have John, who is originally from Turner Falls and is now in Jamaica Plain. Jamaica Plain right next door to where I used to live in Rosendale. I think Josh is maybe back. Josh is back. And it looks like he's just getting his sound set up there. Um, I don't know if anybody um, at home can see in Josh's screen there um, that behind him is a window um, and through that window there is like this vine growing into his room yeah he's adjusting the screen so he can see it there's a vine growing into his room because there is a um like grape grapes for wine vine growing outside of his studio that busted through the window um, this summer and now it's growing on the inside of the home and like all through the wall, which is super beautiful. Josh. Can, 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 you, can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> I, I, uh, my computer just literally stopped and uh, I, uh, I, I uh, had no idea that it was gonna happen, of course. No and, worries, uh, it's okay. Uh, 
We had Sarah join us to talk about the um, amazing Heather Gray t-shirts that folks can get if they become sustaining members with, WG, with GBH. Um, and we're really glad that you're back. So I was asking you before, before you popped out, um, if you can tell us one more time about the children who inspired um, the original, original marble um, structures that you started making, and then we'll get into some questions from the audience. Sure. Um, what happened was that um, I had, um, when I first moved here to town, one of the local school teachers, an eighth grade school teacher, asked me if I would be willing to demonstrate glass blowing to all the eighth graders in Franklin County. Mm -hmm. And I, I willingly agreed, not realizing that there were actually zillions of eighth graders in the county. And so what I had in, inadvertently done was agreed to, uh, agreed to have 80, as many as 80 eighth graders in my studio every Wednesday afternoon uh, for uh, the last week of January, all of February, March, April, May, and the beginning of June. And <laughs> during that time, I discovered that eighth graders will not suffer any boredom in their lives whatsoever. And so, <laughs> I uh, I learned that they loved, they didn't love make, watching me make goblets or vases or bowls or bottles. But one night I thought about the Apollo astronauts and how when they were returning from the moon, actually um, looked out the window of their spacecraft and realized that they could cover the earth with their thumb. And I thought that was amazing. And so I started to make little planets that that could talk to the kids about how big or how small our earth is. And, uh, and, um, and so that's how they started. That's, they weren't, that's they weren't really to sell. They were just to do for fun really in the beginning. That's fantastic. I love that your, your, this work that has become your sort of life's life's work was originally inspired by like, how do I keep these eighth graders engaged? How do I keep them occupied and listening, which I'm sure that a lot of teachers are currently going through in these um, current Zoom times is like, how do I keep these kids engaged? So that's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a question from John in Jamaica Plain who would like to know um, if there are some glass blowers or glass artists that you um, admire. Oh, well, gosh, um, there, there are a lot of historical glass blowers that I I think are amazing. Uh, Frederick Carter is one at Steuben and Louis Tiffany and Lalique. And so there, and Maurice Marineau, there are bunches of, and, and actually ironically, they're glassblowers. Well, actually Tiffany wasn't a glassblower. He was a designer, but he had glassblowers that worked for him. There were, there were also a father and son uh, team um, uh, the, uh, the Nashes, who were glass chemists, and I'm as impressed with their ability to invent new and colorful glasses for Tiffany as anything. Uh, contemporary glass blowers, there are, there are so many of my contemporaries that, that are amazing. Um, it's hard to even name them all. Of, of course, there are very famous ones like Dale Chihuly and people yeah. like that, but there's there so many. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love Chihuly's work myself, which makes me feel fancy that I even know a glass artist besides you. <laughs> um, so we have Lisa who'd like to know, how do you add items inside of the balls? So it sounds like a technical question of like, how does this even all work? Yeah, that's it. What happens is that these spheres, and let me grab another one because the other one rolled away somewhere. Um, <laughs> this, this, um, this sphere does have things inside it and all those things are made of glass. And so what I do is I start with these furnaces that are behind me. Let me see if I can, they're there, more behind me now. Um, I start with these furnaces that are behind me and inside them I melt sand, soda ash and lime to make molten glass and then I add metallic oxides iron or cobalt or copper or gold or selenium to make different colors. And what I end up with is a furnace full of, of colored glass. 
And then I'll take that glass out of my furnace and uh, I gather on the end of a long blowpipe, I'll gather it and then I'll gather a clear glass around it and stretch it like taffy. Mm -hmm. And when I do that, I end up with these long, let me see if I can grab them, these long, I end up with long rods like this. Oh, cool, and, yeah. And these, these have been cut to 30 inch lengths, but then they're cut further to five inch lengths like this. And then I literally take a rubber band and put a rubber band around them. And then a piece of wire around that. And I heat them up in a kill and then stretch them again so that they become, this, these are white filaments. Um, but once they're, they're pulled, they become these long, long filaments, which I then cut into short little lengths. Can you oh, see that? Oh, neat. Yeah, yeah. And I put them on a stainless steel plate like this. And I put these on a stove. It's like a stove on steroids. It gets up to really about 1,000 degrees temperature. And then I can literally pick them up with a tweezer and insert them uh, or put them inside a planet. And the way I make these planets is to take a first gather and then I add, um, I melt silver on the surface that makes blue colors, or I add these little, these little things that I've made ahead of time by taking a tweezer or touching them. And then I gather, I dip the whole thing back in a furnace full of clear glass mm. and, and end up making, forming this, this sphere. Wow. It, you saw me do it. Explaining it sounds really complicated, but if you saw me do it, it looks, it looks easy and simple. Mm, I'm, I'm going to say it's complicated. I'm going I'm to say it's complicated and that you're probably a very talented artist who makes it look easy. <laughs> so we have Harry who's wondering about the largest planet that you ever successfully made and also wondering about the largest planet that you attempted and it was not a success. Um, I got... In, in 2006 or so, I got a challenge from the Corning Museum of Glass to make the world's largest glass sphere made by traditional methods that I use. Mm -hmm. And um, Where is the Corning Museum of Glass? Uh, the Corning Museum is out in Corning, New York, and it is okay. the center for glass blowing in the world. Oh. And, and it's this, an amazing place. If you ever get to visit, you should go. But... David Whitehouse, who was the director of the museum at the time, uh, uh, gave me this challenge, which was to make, they had a big event coming up, which was they were about to uh, acquire the thousandth paperweight or <laughs> paperweight in their collection, which had taken uh, 70 years to accomplish. And they asked me to make the thousandth paperweight in their collection, but they wanted it to be more than a hundred pounds. And that doesn't maybe seem like a lot of glass, but this, that seems like a lot of glass. <laughs> this is a challenge to make, and it weighs a couple of ounces. And uh, yeah. so, to make something that's a hundred pounds had to be at least thirteen inches in diameter, uh, maybe larger. So that sent me off on a year and a half uh, tangent to try to make the world's largest sphere. And uh, and it was actually made more complicated because WGBY and WGBH uh, both decided that they would do a documentary about the making of this thing. So not only did I have the challenge of doing that, but I also had the challenge of having a microphone on while I was trying to do it. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so, um, so I, I, I did manage to make the biggest one that I made that wasn't successful was 139 pounds and it was awful. It was just terrible. It, it, it actually weighed that much, but it, had a, it wasn't shaped well. Um, mm. The one that the museum finally selected was 107 pounds. And, uh, All right. and uh, the, the blowpipe that I made that on, um, I, I needed to make special equipment and, and alter my furnace and do a lot of other stuff to do that. It so it project. sounds like the, the, big, the big stuff sweet spot is somewhere between 100 and 107, but if you push it to 139, then you've gone too far. <laughs> well, you have to imagine um, glass blowing, everything about it is working against you. It's insanely hot. 
Yeah. To begin with. And it's a liquid. So all it really wants to do is drip on the floor and maybe burn you on the way down. Okay? Sure. And, uh, so then you have a blowpipe that, and you balance this molten glass on the end of a blowpipe. And so to get an, I mean, to get an idea of what that's like is pick up a, a five foot two by four and then pick up a cinder block yeah. <laughs> on the end of that and walk around for an hour or two. Um, only, yeah. only in the case of a hundred pound planet, put three or four cinder blocks on. Yeah. Let's see how that goes. That is wild. That is totally wild. Um, okay, so we have Wayne in Colorado who has a question. Um, Wayne says that they visited the Murano in Venice and learned mm -hmm. that many or most studios don't allow visitors to protect their proprietary processes. Um, so Wayne is wondering if most glass artists tend to share this concern. You know, that's kind of a European tradition. Um, I know that in Murano, um, they were very secretive back in the uh, 14th century. If you you could leave the island of Murano, but you couldn't bring your family with you because they they wanted you back and uh, they didn't want you leaving with any secrets. Um, wow. They are still a little bit secretive like that, um, although not as much as they used to be. And in, in this country, it's a little different. Um, 40 or 50 years ago, when we were all still learning uh, glass blowers here in this country, we were all so enamored and excited about this new thing that we were doing that we readily shared information and read, readily shared techniques and, 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 and secrets, if you want to call them secrets. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, the, the idea really is that all of us as artists have a different viewpoint and different things to say so that so that if i have a pen this this tool is the same and the technique of using this pen is the same we all sure. we all kind of write with it um but or write with it but <laughs> we all can write different words or we can draw different drawings with this same tool right. so we all share i think recently or at least in this country we share the techniques we share the tools we share what's exciting about it and all of us understand that we're trying to say something unique ourselves yeah yeah and that sounds a bit like sort of working in collaboration um either like working in collaboration with like a bunch of different people in different studios who are kind of making different but inspired from the same place work or working collaboration in your own studio. So we have Peggy from Boston who has a question. Um, and Peggy says that so much of your work includes colleagues assisting you, um, but Peggy's aware from your own website and emails that you also love to do work on your own as well. And so Peggy's wondering what tasks you can do solo and which ones require more hands to accomplish. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. Um, when I began to blow glass, I worked for the first six years. I, I literally worked seven days a week for probably uh, 360 days a year for five or six years straight alone mm -hmm. by myself. And, um, and there are things that I, I'm so grateful to my crew that helps me blow glass uh, because there are just times when you need more than more than two arms and more than 10 fingers. Uh, and it's so great. Also, in terms of energy, um, somebody can turn the blowpipe for me while I'm getting ready for whatever I'm planning to do next. And, and so I, I genuinely depend on the skill of uh, Tucker Litchfield and the other folks that assist me in the, in the glass studio. Um, but there is something magical about working with glass alone. And, you know, the pandemic presented a unique challenge uh, for my studio because the glass furnaces, though they're turned off now for the summer, can't be just turned off cold turkey. Uh, they have to be emptied and you have to go through a lot of uh, steps to turn them down, turn them off. And so when the pandemic started, I had no idea, of course, how long it was going to go. And... Uh, though I didn't have anybody working here, I, I would come out each morning and I just 
terribly much enjoyed uh, going back to my roots and taking gathers and thinking about things. And I'd have a plan each morning. And so I'd come out here at eight o'clock in the morning. And what was so much fun was that by 10 o'clock, I could be going in a completely <laughs> random other direction. And, yeah. and I love that about working alone. There's just, I just don't need a plan. I can just follow whatever, uh, whatever whim Where, I come wherever to. the art takes you right when I have a team we usually have a, a much more defined plan Absolutely. of attack so our next question is very special it comes from Sloan who is eight years old and Sloan says that their mommy was one of your students and said that you do the best accents and so Sloan has some rapid fire quick questions for you and would like for you to do each one in one of your best accents so Sloan would like to know are you going to make COVID um, like figurines with your glass um, COVID virus mini planets. Sloan would also like to know um, about the family astronaut that inspires you and if you still have kids visit your ranch. Well, I know, oh no, I don't think so. I'm, I'm not gonna make any COVID planets, I don't think. <laughs> and and, and, um, and tell us about the family astronaut that inspires you. It is true that uh, my wife uh, actually was- In an a, accent, it has to be in an accent. Ah, well, <laughs> my, wife was, my wife was an astronaut until just, just a couple of years ago. <laughs> How and, wonderful. And she, uh, she retired from NASA after 26 years or 24 years working there. Uh, she got to go on two space shuttle flights and one long duration mission up to the International Space Station uh, where she lived for six months. And uh, so uh, Katie certainly has been an inspiration for me. Um, and, oh, hi. <laughs> I didn't realize she was right there. Okay, so uh, actually we are using Katie's computer because my computer completely died if she hadn't been here. Well, um, we're, we're uh, glad to have Katie with us as well. And then are you still going to be having kids visiting your ranch? Yeah, um, well, I, 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 I do. Uh, groups of kids do come from time to time. It's, it's sometimes hard to schedule uh, yeah. so that we have something interesting going on knowing yeah. eighth graders need <laughs> to have a lot of excitement but yes that's something that all, seems to always happen and uh and, Fantastic. and it's it's always fun when they come fantastic well we have so we're just about halfway through time and we have 47 questions in the queue. So um, we're going to try to get through as many questions as we can. I know that you were worried that there would be no questions, but lots I, of people I, have I questions. I was worried. That I didn't think anybody would come to this uh, seminar. <laughs> I am gonna, if we have 47 questions, I'm going to get a 47 questions. All right. So the next one is coming from, ooh, we're going to go with William's question, um, which is that if memory serves, you've been encouraging folks to take planets to the far corners of the world. Can you tell us how that's going? Yeah, that's, um, that's a, a fun project that I call the Infinity Project. I actually, on my other computer, had a bunch of slides of, of that. Um, I have... When I first started to blow glass, no museums, no collectors, no galleries were collecting or interested, even interested in my work. And so um, I knew some archaeologists and I just thought, you know, what I should do is I and I, I had actually been to the Museum of Natural History in New York City where they have a glass collection from ancient Rome. And these are pieces from Rome and the Middle East that were not saved in museums, but were just uh, left on the ground or buried or lost or broken. Mm -hmm. And archeologists found them. And so, so 40 years ago, I decided that I would start to make my little planets, uh, do the, take these little planets, and since I wasn't really selling them, I was really making them to give to kids that instead of selling them, I would hide them around the world. And so, <laughs> so whenever I traveled somewhere, I would take a planet with me and I would go to 
uh, I'd be in San Francisco and I'd be at the foot of the uh, the Bay Bridge or the Golden Gate Bridge and I'd just drop a planet at the foot of that bridge. Or if I went traveling or just I, I hid them in lots of stone walls around here. And, uh, and, uh, and so... Um, so are there still globes out there for folks to find? Well, what I did was... As I traveled further and further, I would take planets with me further and further away. But, um, but what I really started to do was get friends mm. to take them for me to different places. So if somebody said they were, well, I have one friend um, who is a mountain climber and he's gone to uh, the base camp of Mount Everest and to... Uh, it, lots and lots of exotic places, whether it's Bhutan yeah. or Antarctica. Yeah. And, and so I'd have friends bring little planets with them. And that has been amazing because people bring back photos. You can go to my website and uh, there's the Infinity Project. And I think there are more than 3,000 planets hidden around the world. That is so cool. In my old neighborhood, people used to hide painted stones, um, and those ah, are really yeah. excited, exciting to find, but I think that a little glass planet would be even more exciting. So Chris from Brookline um, says, Josh, your work is absolutely amazing. What tips do you have for aspiring glass blowers? Uh, you know, I think the most important thing as a glass blower is to learn all the techniques that you can, it, it's challenging. It's this liquid, it's this liquid material that just doesn't want to cooperate. It, <laughs> it has no sense of uh, camaraderie with you. It doesn't care about you. It just wants to drip on the floor. And so as a beginning artist, you need to explore all the techniques that you can to try to become, try to learn how to convince it to go into the shape that you like. But the most important thing I think if you're, if you're starting to be a class person is to kind of think about who you are mm. and, and look into your own, I don't know, your own soul and try to decide what, what, what you think is beautiful and, and try to make things that inspire you that are exciting to you to make. And if you can do that, then what you'll do is make something that's unique that isn't hasn't been seen before and we, will please you that's the most important thing but what yeah. i found is that things that i love to make sometimes people like to buy them and that's that's excellent when you can yeah i once heard someone say that art is the act of getting people to look at the things that you find most beautiful um and it sounds like that's the main tip is like do do what you think is beautiful and probably other people are gonna to want to look at it. So we have a question from Beth um, who says, does the pigmentation in your glass work fade um, if it's exposed to sunlight for a long, long period of time? It's amazing. The, the short answer is absolutely 100% no. Uh, glass color is not really pigment. It is a metallic oxide that is uh, trapped within the glassy matrix of, of the glass. Mm. And that pigment at whatever molecular level it is reflects or absorbs different colors. So the, the piece of my glass or most any glass that is out there, if it's blue or green or yellow or red or whatever, can be out in the sun forever and it will stay the same color. There is one exception to that, which is that, in the uh, in the 1800s, if you use sand from a beach, for example, that sand has uh, some iron contamination mm. in it, and so glass. If you if you just grab a bucket of sand from the beach and melt that into glass, it'll be Coke bottle green, the classic Coke bottle green color. <laughs> and so in the 1800s, glass makers really were trying to make clear glass and they would add something called manganese dioxide to the green glass and the, the purple of the manganese dioxide counteracted the iron and it made the glass clearer. But over time, the manganese did change. Mm -hmm. But basically, no glasses that are melted today or certainly not any art glass will, it won't change color. 
they will stay beautiful for forever. For um, like so, for hundreds and hundreds of years, <laughs> thousands so maybe. Greta is wondering, and I'm also wondering this too, how, I mean, I'm assuming that you're not touching the glass by hand as you're making it, but the spheres are so, right, I mean, it's molten, so, but the spheres are so perfectly round, so how, how are you accomplishing that perfectly round shape? I will show you, because right here, I have, oh. uh, this is a, this is a block, it's dry now, but it's apple wood. And it's, it's got a long handle. And uh, so apple wood, fruit wood, apple, cherry, mulberry, peach, fruit wood has this funny ability to absorb water in its grain structure. And so if you leave it, if you cut it green and shape it into this sort of uh, shape, spoon shape, ladle shape, um, and leave it underwater, then when the glass comes in contact with this, uh, with this, it, it, uh, the water comes out as steam and protects the wood from the, the molten glass. And then I'm holding this at the end of, uh, at the end of my, you know, some distance away. Yeah. And even though this is not round, you can shape the, with this, you right. can shape the glass to make it round. And it, it does amazing. work. Uh, and it, again, it's just, it's just practicing and learning and experimenting and kind of getting the the skill set necessary to do that. Yeah, and making mistakes and learning from them, like we said earlier. Um, so Michelle in Colorado um, says that they are a huge collector um, huh. um, and one of her favorite varieties of your work are the Corona Mega Planets. Um, and Michelle would like to know how you achieve the variety of swirly colors in these works of art well first thank you for helping with my mortgage i appreciate that and <laughs> by collecting my glass but um one of the one of the weirdest things that happened when i first started to blow glass i i was very i experimented with a lot of things by adding uh, silver and tin and cobalt and copper to, to my glass to make different, trying to make different colors. And I would add a teaspoon of one thing and a smidge of something else and a little bit of something else, but I never kept track of that. Mm -hmm. And so in the late seventies, one day I did all of that and I ended up with the most stunningly beautiful glass. It was red and yellows and blues and purples and magenta colors and uh, which I called Corona glass. Mm. And uh, and then I could never melt it again because I hadn't written down. I knew it was two teaspoons, but were they even teaspoons? Were they heaping teaspoons? I didn't really know. And, and so, uh, so 30 years went by when I, I kept trying to uh, melt this glass and I never could do it until 2008. And in 2008, on uh, September 15th of 2008, Lehman Brothers, the investment firm went out of business. They filed for bankruptcy. Oh. And with that, the entire economy of the United States seemed to crash. And all my galleries called and said, listen, we don't, we can't, we can't buy your glass anymore. We don't, the economy's gone. And suddenly I was left with a studio that was running, but no orders from any of my galleries. And, mm. and so I just decided that I would use the, that time when I suddenly was given a break, not a break that I wanted, but I, I was given a break to experiment and do uh, all this research into how I made that glass 30 years before. And it was actually a glass that was probably invented in 1438 uh, by a guy named Angelo uh, um, Barovier. Mm. Angelo Barovier. And, uh, and uh, he died though without he had the formula in his head. He didn't write it down either. He didn't write it down. So <laughs> anyway, I figured it out. And that's, there are literally, I've melted f almost 500 different formulas of this very complex glass. And it does have the ability to have swirling colors and all kinds of things. So uh, that's very but, cool. And it sounds like Josh, you're just the kind of person who 
you know, takes an adversity and turns it into something else, which sounds pretty akin to glass blowing itself. That it's like this you're you you're doing an art form that's like the the material does not want you to do this. Um, and you're like, we're gonna make it work and we're gonna make it beautiful. And you did that with the kids and the marbles, you did that with the economy crashing. I mean, it seems like you're definitely just that kind of a guy, which is awesome. Well, that is the challenge of making it glass, <laughs> true. So we have another question from the audience. Someone um, would like to know if you are still going to be holding your annual open house this fall and they say, fingers crossed. <laughs> no, the answer is no. Um, but I wasn't ever intending to. It had nothing to do with the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, I had a, I've been here at my studio for 43 years now and I had one at the 20 year mark and then I had one at the 30 year mark and then I skipped five years. And so yeah. currently I'm thinking of having a, stu a studio sale every two years. So a, it was last fall and then we were gonna skip this year and next fall. The reason I don't do it is because it's such a pain to clean up the studio. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but I wanted to say, I wanted to say that I swept the studio today uh, thanks to doing this webinar. It looks so, lovely. It looks thanks lovely. GBH. <laughs> thanks for cleaning up for us. Um, but I, wanna... I, will, I will do the studio sale uh, probably in 2021. Good stuff. We'll all be ready to go out in the world in many different ways and get some glass too. I want to remind everyone that Josh's website, megaplanet.com, um, is in the chat. So please check that out if you would like to see some more of his work. Um, and Josh, we have a question from Lauren out in Truro, Mass, who would like to know how much of the spheres that you're making is blowing versus gathering and shaping? Actually, uh, that's a great question because the spheres, there's, there's literally no, no blowing in these solid objects, whether they're little or, or really big. Oh. They, they, uh, this thing weighs, I don't know, 20, that 30 pounds. That is so beautiful. And, and uh, yeah. so the, these are, these are, I gotta put it down now. Um, Let it roll away, yeah. <laughs> So they are all solid. They're, they are not blown. We call it blown glass for, it should be handmade glass or something like that. But I do make lots of things that are, are blown. Like this is one of the goblets that I used to make in the 1980s. I stopped in 87 making these. And I make things like, these are tectite pieces that use, um, that use the same formula of glass as meteorites from outer space. Wow. And these are blown. So these are hollow, but- um, It but looks like a seashell. It does. It, it's, yeah. it's got that iridescent interior, yeah. abalone yeah. kind of look. So, so most, mo all planets are solid. They're not, they're not hollow. And, but most of my other work, whether it's plates or bowls or vases or or vases. Do you know the difference between a no? I don't. Tell a, me. A vase and a vase. A fancy about person. A uh, about a hundred bucks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I'll so. tell you, Josh. Um, we have some some requests coming from behind the scenes and also in the audience of folks that would like for you to please make the wine glasses again. So if you've got <laughs> extra time on your hands during the pandemic, you've got some special requests and people would like to see those blown glass. Um, I, I actually think there are some, I, th I think there are some of the ancient ones on my website still, Ooh. if somebody wants to see them. Well, so whoever gets there first, maybe. Um, yeah. So Robin would like to know, given that glass has a mind of its own, how do you balance between what you plan to do and then what the glass does by itself? The glass is challenging and argumentative and occasionally can be coaxed in the direction that you want it to go. But it's always, always, always um, the combination of me, the artist, and, and the person trying to push that donkey mm -hmm. and, and, and the glass. So, so I'd like to say that, that it's, it's really a dance that we do together. And the moment when I stop is the moment when both the glass, when the glass and me agree. And mm -hmm. so there is always a, an element of serendipity to these pieces. 
less and less the more years that I do it, I, I usually have a pretty good idea of how this material is going to react and what's going to happen. But I am occasionally delighted and surprised and horrifically disappointed at, <laughs> at different times. It just, it just depends. And the irony is that I have to make something, put it on a blowpipe, form the whole thing, take it off and put it into a cooling oven at a thousand degrees temperature. <laughs> and and it, can take, it can take days or weeks for it to come out. And, and so it can look completely different. The colors can change mm. uh, while they cool, especially the Corona glass. And so, wow. so it can be much more exciting than it was when I put it away or, or a complete thud. And well, uh, I'll say when I was a senior in high school, I've never worked with glass, but I worked with metals. Um, mm -hmm. And I was signed up for AP physics class. And I went to the first day of class and I was like, this seems hard. So I dropped it. And then I took an independent study in jewelry design instead. And mm -hmm. I spent the rest of that semester taking pieces of metal and then putting a torch to the metal so that the top layer started to move around and then kind of similar to what you were saying, like when I felt like it was also saying it was ready to stop moving around, I took the fire off um, and just kind of waited to see what happened and what position it melted in. And sometimes it felt like it was on purpose and sometimes it felt like a mistake. Um, it's, and Janice, it's always a, it's always a negotiation. Exactly, always a exactly. It was like I was, I was in control, but I was not completely in control. And I kind of enjoyed that part of the process. So Janice has a question that seems sort of related to that. Um, um, Janice is wondering if there's ever something that you did that you thought was a mistake, but then it became like a process that became incorporated into your work. Yes, and uh, I have, I, I actually used to wake up in, in the morning when we'd open the annealing oven and I would literally take things out and I would, smash them right there and then if they if they didn't meet whatever idea i had and um but i later learned min, a number of years ago i we have a it's actually a room right behind these furnaces mm -hmm. um where i keep things that are a disappointment for a while some some things <laughs> we are a disappointment and i throw them out but there are other things that didn't turn out the way I thought they would. And I put them on, a, on what's called the triage shelf. And, and about once every couple of years, I look at that shelf and, and every now and then there's something there that is amazingly beautiful. But at the time, it, it wasn't what I intended. It wasn't mm -hmm. what I had planned. And I would have trashed it. And so I have learned over time to not trust my immediate next morning judgment of things to wait. And, and so actually the, um, the opening first piece that was at the Berkshire Museum show of my work last year uh, was called Flame Front. And it was a, a relatively small platter that had this beautiful pattern in it that was a disappointment at the time that I made it, but it turned out to be one of the nicest pieces that I've ever done. Mm. So, who would have thought? Sounds like you're maturing as an artist, which is great. Um, so we have a question from Nicholas who wants to know uh, more about your process as an artist kind of throughout time. Nicholas is wondering um, that it seems like your work has become more colorful over time. And Nicholas is wondering what your favorite color is and your favorite color to work with. And Nicholas is also wondering if you have a concept of a higher power or a highest power and how that is reflected in your work. Uh, my work has become more colorful over time, and it, it's actually for the first, I don't know, 35 years that I blew glass, I used only recycled glass. Mm. So I would literally get what was swept off the floor of a factory in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, <laughs> and they would pack it in 55-gallon drums and ship it to me, and then I would remelt that glass. But... The problem with that glass was that I didn't control the formula and the factory did. Yeah. And so when I wanted to make my own colors, I, I could add color to this broken glass. I could add metallic oxides like cobalt or copper or 
whatever mm -hmm. to that glass, but I could never control the base formula of the glass. And so in, in 2008 is when the factory that made that broken glass or sold me their broken glass, that, that factory went out of business. Mm. And, it, and, and it, it, I thought it would open someday, but it turned out they bulldozed it and made it into a parking lot. And so I was kind of up a, up a creek at that point and had to learn how to melt my own glass from scratch. Mm. So now I take sand, soda ash, and lime, those three basic minerals, along with some feldspar, and a little bit of 20 mule team borax of all things. <laughs> and, and I mix those things together in a cement mixer and I can add my own uh, metallic oxides to that. And so I am capable now of making brighter colors. And so it's really a technical, ah. a technical thing that has allowed me to, um, to just do more exciting and more vibrant and more, uh, I think it's more interesting uh, in a way the muted colors also appeal to me too. But, yeah. um, and, and, um, and in terms of a higher power, I believe there are glass gods that are malevolent that always are trying to keep you from being successful but if you if you're careful you can avoid those malevolent gods and make nice objects yeah um thank you we have a question we're almost time to it's almost time for us to wrap um but we have a question from steve who um yes from steve who says that um Steve and their wife have piece, pieces of your work on display in their home in Cape Cod. They're inspirational and sometimes they just stare at them and allow their minds to wander. Um, at this time, where would you say is the best place to see more of your work on display? You mentioned the Corning Glass Museum, um, but is there one muse other museums that have your work in the Northeast? And also if you can let us know where folks can purchase your work if they're interested. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've got sort of a little list here that I can read from there. There are, uh, uh, there's a, a bunch of museum shops that sell my work that in mm -hmm. Boston, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, nice. Springfield, the Springfield Library Museums uh, sell my work, Peabody Essex um, sells my work, Corning Museum, the Bruce Museum in Greenwich, Connecticut. Fuller Craft Museum in uh, also just south of Boston, Worcester uh, 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 Worcester Art Center in Worcester, Wonderful. and the Berkshire Museum. Along with, you, if you really are determined to buy my glass, you can go to my website, which is <laughs> megaplanet.com, and uh, and we'd be delighted to uh, have you stop by there. And and there is a gallery in Shelburne Falls called Salmon Falls. Uh, gallery in Shelburne Falls, Massachusetts that sells my work along with Don Muller Gallery uh, in Northampton. Wonderful. Um, well, Josh, it's been a delight to chat with you. Um, I want to remind everyone who's watching um, that there's going to be an email that comes out from WGBH following this event, and that's going to have um, listings and links of places that you can um, find Josh's work and maybe find one of those now very rare uh, wine glasses <laughs> from, from 1987, those vintage pieces. Um, in the meantime, we're gonna bring up Sarah again to um, talk to us a little bit more about fundraising with WGBH. Sarah. Thanks, Teresa, and thanks, Josh. I feel like I've learned so much about glass blowing, and I honestly can say I didn't know anything before today, but I know for sure that I'm going to look into more stuff in the future. And, but I also wanna thank everyone for tuning in to our Ask the Expert event this afternoon. The weather is hot and the sun is strong, so we got you covered with our WGBH tea. It's a soft poly cotton blend that's so comfortable and fashionable at the same time. And you can look good and feel good while wearing it. All it takes is $7.50 a month, or you can give $90 all at once. But to do so, you go to wgbh.org slash support events, and you can make a donation and receive this shirt as a token of our thanks. 
show you're a fan of GBH and public radio when you get out and about wearing your new shirt. Go to wgbh.org slash support events today and to make it super easy for you. We actually just put the link in our chat. Anyways, uh, back to you, Teresa and Josh. Thank you so much, Sarah. And I hope that folks- Would you trade uh, a planet for one of those shirts? <laughs> I want one. I want one too. I don't have anything to trade, but I want one too. <laughs> Well, Josh, um, I'm really, really delighted that I was able to chat with you this afternoon. Thank you so much again for vacuuming your studio and joining us um, today, chatting with us a bit. Um, it's clear that you have a lot of fans of your work um, who were able to join us. There were so many questions in the chat, so many questions in the Q&A, and and i am really sorry that we weren't able to get to all of them, um, but we're really glad that everyone was able to join us this afternoon. And once again, Josh, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great. Yes, it's absolutely. Fun. All right, everyone. Um, have a fantastic rest of your day and have an even better weekend. Bye now.